just talk us through, because you know, I remember very well the night of the handover. We, we I then worked for the BBC, we prepared for it for, for weeks. In fact, we, we had built this studio in the, I think it was called the Arts Academy. And then, much to our horror, a, 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 a skyscraper went up like a souffle, that we, <laughs> blocking the view entirely. It was, it was absolutely horrific. And then we, sort of, we found a way around it. But it, was, it rained a lot. The rain got worse and worse. And I still remember the raindrops bouncing off Prince Charles's hat. Just tell us, and you describe it wonderfully in the book, in your diaries, how the froideur of the meeting between you, know, you and Tony Blair and uh, um, Robin Cook, I guess, and then on the Chinese side, you know, Jiang Zemin, amongst others. And there was not a lot of love lost between the two, and it was all rather perfunctory. Tell yeah, us about th that. there had been literally months of negotiations about the exact details of the handover. Um, but the, the, the heroes in our joint liaison group um, diplomatic team had had to put up with the most sort of Lewis Carroll-like um, arguments from, uh, from the Chinese side. There were some serious ones, which was the Chinese attempts to send thousands of the garrison into Hong Kong mm. before we withdrew. Um, but there were, there were others, ridiculous ones about who should come into which room before whom, I mean, all that sort of mm. stuff. Um, so this had gone on for, for months, and we, we, we had a bottom line, and we just stuck to it, and eventually things didn't work out too badly, and in particular in relation to the, to the press, who, who weren't um, uh, cornered or, or kept, kept at a distance. So when it comes to the point... We'd agreed that the that, um, Prince of Wales and Jiang Zemin would enter a room from different doors at exactly the same moment with their entourages. So I think it was five aside or six aside. So they come in and a lot of bowing and ah and handshakes, and we sit opposite one another. And uh, the, the Prince of Wales, to do him credit, gives extempore a very good little speech about. Um, about uh, one country, two systems, and about uh, the joint declaration and the agreement between the two sides. Um, and uh, uh, um, the Chinese response um, uh, is based on something they'd heard Robin Cook say, that we wanted Hong Kong to be seen as um, a bridge, not an obstacle, something like that. Mm. So, Robin, so that, that is said in response. And Tony Blair is whispering to me and saying, do you think I should say something next? And I said, yes, sure. And he goes ahead and says something very intelligent about the relationship mm -hmm. between Britain and China. And then the Chinese side get up to leave. So we've been through all these ridiculous negotiations just for a, a, what Ernest Bevan used to call clitches to be exchanged mm. from, from, from both sides. Um, and we, we then went, went on, on with the feast and we had the... Um, the, the marching and one or two um, ill-advised Brits went to the sign, went to the swearing-in of the new uh, alleged legislators in the, in Legco. Mm. Um, but otherwise, what, what really struck me was you went through this crazy pantomime with with officials who were claiming to have the mandate of heaven and and to be um, the exemplars of the most civilized way of doing business. No way. But there was a lot of show and tell that night, wasn't there? I remember standing on the border watching, four, was it 4,000 PLA troops that came across the border? Yeah. Standing like, like, you know, like terracotta warriors in the back of trucks. It was not a, it, and, and cheered by a few, you know, very yeah, enthusiastic, Front, yeah. um, either, you know, Hong Kongers who wanted to curry favor, or perhaps they thought it was the right thing, or maybe they were, yeah. I don't know. But it was a very, it was a chilling sight, I have to say. Yeah, and, and I, there were some people, I never really had this, this worry myself, who thought, who, who thought in terms of the possibilities of a Tiananmen uh, in mm. uh, Hong Kong. I never thought that myself. Um, uh, I, I didn't think the Chinese could be that stupid. Um, uh, but, um, of course, they were uh, in, in killing their own people in Tiananmen over those, over all those years ago. And it's another example of, the, of rewriting history. One of the first things they've done in, in Hong Kong is to stop the annual vigil. Mm. Vigils take place all over the world. There was one here, um, a big meeting in Parliament Square. Um, uh, even last year, 
there were police taking photographs of people going in and out of Catholic masses um, on, the, uh, on the 4th of June to remember the martyrs. Yeah. Um, they closed the, um, the Tiananmen Museum. Um, they, uh, this has all happened recently. This has all mean, happened yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they took down the, 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 sure. the, the statues and so on. And it's all this, this assumption that you can, you don't bury the scholars anymore, but you yeah. bury the results of their, of their scholarship. You can't rewrite the past like, like that. I mean, it, sooner or later, people remember um, what actually happened. I, I want to talk about what's happened to Hong Kong in the last few years, because it's incredibly important. And I, you know, I think we both agree that Hong Kong is a sort of, for want of a better expression, a canary in the mine. You know, it's where the relationship between us, the West, and China is tested more than anywhere yeah. else. But just before that, when you left on the Royal Yacht Britannia that night, and it was incredibly emotional, it must have been unbelievably emotional for you, but it was emotional for us being there. And I remember that you know, the weather was terrible, then you described wonderfully how the next day or the day after, as you approached Man the Bay of Manila, the weather had improved and there were dolphins and kingfishers following the boat, you know, ordered obviously by the government of the day, you know. <laughs> Those days dolphins were still very obedient creatures. Um, but did you think then that one country and two systems would work and would last for as long as it was supposed to last? Or did you have serious doubts at the time? I hoped it would last. I never believed, as um, Milton Friedman did, that the whole idea of one country, two systems was oxymoronic, that you couldn't have um, a free society with um, market economy and rule of law um, inside a, a sovereign Chinese mm. communist state. Um, I always thought it was, it was possible that the Chinese would be so aware of the disadvantages if they crushed Hong Kong that they would allow it to continue more or less as it was. And that there was, might even be a chance of the way Hong Kong did things permeating bits of Chinese society. And to some extent, given how uh, what happened in the ten or a dozen years um, afterwards, that wasn't an unrealistic prospect under Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, though one of the people who's now in prison um, waiting um, uh, for, a, for a trial, Claudia Mo, yeah. um, uh, wrote at the time about her some of her anxieties about how China was interfering more and more. The other thing I, I, I thought, I'd, I never really believed um, uh, in the idea that there was a sort of um, umbilical cord between uh, economic progress and political change. Mm. I thought it was. I thought it was likely that there would be some political change in time, but I thought I didn't think it was. It was mechanistic. But that was the assumption amongst many Western leaders. Yeah, it was, it? And, and it went on and on. I mean, um, I, I, I mentioned later um, uh, Tony Blair after we after the Chinese Communist regime had signed the um, WTO agreement. Uh, Tony Blair saying um, that Chinese China's road to democracy is now unstoppable. What happened? Um, so, but I did, I will say there's one other thought I had, that we had to negotiate with the Chinese about every little bit, every pinhead um, involved in the, not, over, not only over the airport, but everything. Mm. And I thought, could they possibly spend all that energy and effort negotiating on all, those, all these tiny details and then simply water walk away from them. Mm. It seemed to me that it was, that was unlikely to happen. So, so I hoped that it would go well. Um, and to some extent, it didn't go too badly for a bit. But um, my, my, my surprise initially wasn't anything that happened uh, between Beijing and Hong Kong. My surprise initially was the way the rest of the world looked at mm. what was happening. I mean, the extent to which Hong Kong was seen as a sort of, as an example of a process which so many European countries had gone through with decolonization. Mm. I remember, and the way I, they identified with this, I've, I've, I've told before, I think, the story about, I've got a house in France and, and going there in order to avoid whiskey and soda, having to go into, uh, uh, into kennels here because of, quote, rabies, allegedly. 
Um, I, I remember we were, I was on a walk and stopped by an old French farmer who said, where did I come from? And I told him uh, about the village we lived in three or four miles away. And he said, have you met the, have you met the great man who's moved into your village? <laughs> and so I said, uh, very modestly, I said, um, no, I said, uh, who's that? Oh, he said, he's a very great man. Uh, he, was, uh, he did a great job in, in uh, Asia. He was governor of Saigon. <laughs> and, I love it. Very good. And, you know, for the French, there was, an, there was, there was an empire. And did you, have, did you have an empire as well, Britain? No, oh, really. Exactly. Very good. The, um, just, how often did you write this diary, by the way? Did you do something every night or every no, morning? For, for what was the, your routine? I'll tell you exactly what the routine was. And I'll tell you the bit that worked best. For the first maybe three years, three and a half years, um, I used to dictate every Saturday or Sunday morning um, uh, in, into a recorder with the help of my weekly diary. Mm. Um, and then send these, these tapes back to my two um, uh, former PAs um, in, uh, in London. Um, and they would type them up. The last year and a half or so, I wrote in a hard um, uh, exercise book, lined exercise book, every night. And I did that because I thought I was just missing some of the humor of what was happening. And it was partly um, uh, triggered by a visit by Michael Heseltine, who's a man I much admire and like. Mm. He's a friend of mine. But the, but the, but the weekend was so funny that I thought I had to write that down. And it was partly funny, because by that stage, Michael, who's a terrific swashbuckling political figure, um, flashbang wallop, mm. um, and terrific, gets things done. He's an argument for having politicians. He's on the, he's on the right side of most uh, arguments. He wasn't entirely on the right side on China, but that's another matter. Um, but he came, and he was trapped by that stage. He was quite near the... Um, the end of the major government. He was travelling on fairly light briefing. Uh, and one country, two systems, at his initial press conference, turned into one nation, two states, which <laughs> wasn't entirely what they'd, what they'd had in mind. And there were one or two other variants of that. And I was waiting. We'd, we'd, we'd had some disagreements, but never, ever fell out. He's one of those people who's, who's, who's demonstrably loyal when there's a collective decision. Mm. And there always was, and it was always, in, I'm pleased to say, eventually even with Michael Howard in my, in my, um, uh, my favour. Anyway, I'm waiting for him to say to me during the course of the weekend that um, he doesn't think I've been handling it all entirely well and it's having an effect on British business. Nothing happens. So on the Saturday night before he's going on the Sunday, Michael says to me, um, Chris, we must have a private word before, before I and go you thought, tomorrow. Uh -oh. <laughs> I thought, uh-oh. So the following morning, um, he, uh, he says, can we go outside and, and, and just have a word together? So we walk out onto the balcony where I've got lots of um, shrubs, which I borrowed from a Buddhist monastery. And uh, Michael says, look, you're not to take this personally. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're friends and I don't want you to think badly of me when I say this. <coughs> but you're not pruning the bonsais properly. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh. How can you ever recover from that? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, the, um... so, then, so then I was writing every day and I think, it's, I think to anybody else who's thinking of a diary, you, you don't think at the end of the day you'll, you'll, um, you'll want to do it. But if you're if you take alcohol, it's quite helpful because, because it tends to discourage you from taking too much alcohol a day right. and then writing three or four hundred words, which I was doing every day. So That's a lot. Maybe it's even fun more. not to write, isn't it? No, sometimes five, yeah. six hundred. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, looking at your illustrious career, which of course, you know, you're still, you're still Chancellor of Oxford University, but you were chairman of the Tory party, you were governor of Hong Kong, um, you were EU commissioner in Brussels. I mean, every institution that you have run or been part of, to some extent, has gone tits up, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> and I'm not blaming you. I'm not blaming you, Chris, but I'm just saying... No, don't give me that look. No. <laughs> you know, Oxford is not... That, that, that has, and, yeah, right. we've, left, we've left the EU, the, the BBC... the best university in the world. I know. 
doing incredibly well. But, um, but how does that, when you look back at your careers, because there are many of them. Well, the, you could have gone further, because the thing, the most difficult job I've ever had, and the one I'm in some respects most proud of, because it was so difficult, was to reorganize the police service in Northern Ireland after yes, the Good Friday yeah. Agreement. And that has worked so far. Though now the, the uh, Good Friday Agreement, I think, is, is um, threatened by the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, as it's called. I don't want to go into details about that this evening. Um, but uh, there's a sort of casual disregard for, mm. for what was basic to the Good Friday Agreement. But it is true that, that um, I haven't, on the whole, um, uh, taken on um, easy assignments, as they say. <laughs> I remember when I, was, when I was doing the job in Northern Ireland, um, Norman Tebbit saying to people uh, when, when they were asked why I'd done it, he said he shouldn't have done it because it's, it's helpful to the Labour government that he's doing it. Um, and then saying, um, uh, of course, he's, he's only doing it for the money. The millions. The, the, the per diem or whatever it was, yeah. Just good to get, we're going to open up the questions in a minute, but just to get back to China, um, is the big thing that's happened that's really shafted Hong Kong in so many ways in the last few years, the figure of Jiang Zemin. Is that the big thing? Or the thing, the even if someone else had been in, in that job, Xi it would have yeah. the, big, the big thing that's happened, and the thing which, in a way... Sorry, not um, Xi Jinping. Yeah, yeah. In a way, the, the thing which makes some of what we discuss about our exercise of responsibilities up to 1997, um, it's not, they're not entirely irrelevant, but uh, irrelevant, I mean, but um, we weren't to know that the Chinese Communist Party, having s moved in a direction in which things were sort of loosening up a bit, um, would then um, be run from 2012, 2013, by somebody who wanted to go back to um, iron control mm. over every aspect of society. And it was a surprise to people because um, th that he, he turned out to be a, 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 such a fan of, of Mao um, because his father was, was, was shut away by, mm. by Mao and only released by Deng Xiaoping and was one of, one of Deng Xiaoping's leading reformers. So it's, a, it's rather a surprise that he turned out as he has. But I think, I think to be frank, there was one um, a, immediate reason and three underlying reasons. The immediate reason was I'm convinced that the Chinese leadership was spooked by Bo Xilai, um, the, the Chinese leader, you'll remember, whose, whose wife was um, uh, thought guilty of murdering a British businessman. Mm. And I think he, with the then head of, the, of security, Yeo Yang Khan, and, and, and uh, energy, I think tried to muscle his way into the past party leadership, and I think that really worried them. Then there were three um, bigger reasons, I think. First of all, I think China became extremely worried about globalization and its implications for mm. China. Secondly, worried about... Even though about, it had benefited enormously from Absolutely. It. Secondly, worried about urbanization. Um, and thirdly... Uh, worried about um, environmental issues um, with uh, you know, all the water in the south and mm. most of the need in the north. And uh, I, I think we, what we shouldn't be today, we certainly shouldn't be scared of Russia as a, as a, as a great power. It has a, a, a monstrous um, paranoid liar running it. Um, and uh, and it's but you know it's a declining country in every sense. If, if you can never if you can never think of anything apart from the energy which we've which we've been rather greedy about that anybody buys. I mean, how many people have got anything in their home made in Russia except vodka and dolls and and dolls? Hmm. Yeah, um, or may, maybe the odd copy of, of uh, War and Peace, but um, or if or if they're more sensible, Life and Fate. So. But Ch China, on the other hand, China is a big... So I think we're in a period of post-peak Putin, which is difficult to handle. I also think we are in a period of post-peak China, because China faces... Uh, you know, we've got enough problems, but China faces huge economic problems, mm. all the ones that were identified by Hu Jintao. Sorry, by, when, by his prime minister, Wen Jiabo. Yeah. The... the um, the, the four uns, he called them, um, unstable, 
and sustainable and so on. Um, the indebtedness in China is probably 300% uh, of GDP. Um, George Magnus, who writes extraordinarily well about the Chinese economy, was arguing last week that the indebtedness in local government in China, which is where any boost for the economy would need to come from, is twice the size of the German, eco of the German economy. Secondly, uh, I think there are really big problems of, of demography, not just the aging population, not just the, um, the low fertility rate, but the thing which always shocks me most, you, you look it up, the gender imbalance getting bigger and mm. bigger as yeah. you go down the ages. So from 10 to 20, the imbalance between boys and girls is nearly 20%. I mean, Which is it's, astonishing. A, it's yeah. absolutely astonishing. Yeah. You think what the implications are for, for the future. So I think facing problems like that, as well as the environmental issue which I mentioned, I, I think um, uh, Xi Jinping faces really, really, or China faces really big problems. And uh, I would love to have a relationship with them in which we weren't containing them, but trying to work with them to deal with problems which are, which are planetary. But it's very difficult working with them if they always break their agreements with you. I mean, the thing that really... I remember I was in Beijing the night they got the Beijing Olympics in 2000. And, um, and there were armoured vehicles on the streets. And I said, why would you put armoured vehicles on the streets? You know, this is a happy occasion. This is a great patriotic milestone for Beijing. And one of our fixers, a Chinese student who was working with us, said because this government is more afraid of its own people than yeah, yeah. it is of anyone else. And I think that is still the case, you know. Yeah, and, but, and one of the reasons I think why, um, why they've been so tough on Hong Kong um, is because at the beginning of Xi Jinping's rule, um, they issued a series of instructions which are called in a rather Orwellian way, communique number nine. <laughs> Um, which said the party carders and government carders had to f fight an intense struggle against all the aspects of, uh, as it were, a liberal democracy. And they, they list them all. Freedom of speech, um, rule of law, separation of powers, and so on. And you read them all and you realise it's a description of Hong Kong. I'm not saying mm. Hong Kong was the only thing that worried them, but if they're worried about those things, then they look at Hong yeah. Kong and they see them all manifested. Yeah. Um, but also the way that they introduced the national security law under the cover of COVID. And they've done a lot of things under the cover of COVID. And you wonder to what extent they've really seen COVID, the zero COVID policy, not just as a public health issue that needs some extreme draconian measures, but as a kind of glimpse of how they want to run the country. Well, if they do, it certainly screws the economy. Yeah. I mean, the, the economy is doing particularly badly now, and it's almost certain that um, we're going to be talking about a far lower um, growth rate in the future in China because of this. And um, the economy is suffering, among other things, from the zero COVID policy mm. and the impact on the economy and the impact on, on, on society as a whole. and their relationship with Russia over Ukraine. I mean, they, have, they, they seem increasingly to the rest of the world like accomplices. And the surprising thing you have, to, you have to consider, The Economist wrote a very interesting piece about this the other day. They should know a lot about Ukraine. Mm. Huawei is all over Ukraine. Yeah. It's one of the countries in the Belt and Roads Initiative, though I imagine that most of that infrastructure has now been destroyed by Russian artillery. Um, so they must but get a lot of intelligence from Hong Kong, but they from about Ukraine, but their inability to analyze it, or um, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, inability to to understand what mess what the but, messages are. But for all those things, whether it's the way they've treated Hong Kong in the last, you know, two years, whether it's the zero COVID policy, whether it's an excessive flirtation with Vladimir Putin, it flies in the face of the assumption that we all made in the past that whatever you say about Beijing, they are ruthlessly pragmatic. This doesn't sound like pragmatic policy. No, and, and it certainly screws any idea that the, this is a, a wiser system of government than any other around the world. I mean, we are making some horrible errors, not least in the United States and, and Europe, about, about the nature of democracy. I mean, don't ask me about the 6th of January last year or the Republican mm. Party. We make terrible errors. But 
there is inherent strength in in uh, uh, in democracies, which, the corrective which mechanism, they're, which which they're exactly yeah. which they're which they're terrified of, and we have a we have a real weakness, I think, which was um, something which was mentioned again and again by um, the feistiest journalist I've ever known, Jonathan Mursky. I mean, he made feisty seem like such an understatement. I've never known anybody to storm out of as many dinner parties as, mm. as Jonathan because somebody had said something which he thought was outlandish or, or immoral. Um, he was a great journalist um, and wonderfully impossible. And he covered, he was the observer's man in uh, Beijing, in, in Beijing at the time of the- He was in Tiananmen Square. He was, he got Square. shingles Absolutely. as a result, yeah. He got, um, he was, he was helped to escape by the man who's now, I think, the chief executive of News International, Robert Thompson, mm. Mm. Um, with a broken arm or a, sh or a shattered arm and five teeth missing. But the, the thing that I think most reinforced his feelings about calling out wickedness, he's standing with a group of students um, uh, on the fringes of Tiananmen Square, and they all hear the sound of, of, of rifles guns going off and the kid sitting next to him says to him don't worry grandpa he says um uh, they're using plastic bullets rubber bullets at which point this kid drops dead at mirsky's feet with a red hole in his forehead and mirsky always 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 thought we should call out behavior which is wicked and it's not some clever diplomatic um, example of, of, of real politic not mm. to do so. What, Pu what Putin is doing in Ukraine is wicked, and we should say so. What is happening in Xinjiang is wicked, and we should say so. What is happening in Hong Kong is almost as wicked, and we should say so. And I think one, is, one thing which is true of all tyrants is they hate being put on the spot. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm entirely in favor of trying to find ways in which we can um, work with China, provided they stick to the rules. I'm not in favor of containing China, but Gerald Siegel, Siegel used to say we should constrain China when it's behaving badly, and, and I, I, I think we should. Um, and uh, I think that means liberal democracies working together, um, standing up for one another, um, as we haven't many, many times in the past. But then you get, you know, then business intervenes. I remember the day after the national security law was imposed in Hong Kong, HSBC took out a full-page ad in the South China Morning Post congratulating the government of Beijing. I mean, okay, enough said yeah, about that. I, but but <laughs> there, there, is one, there is one thing to remember about, about a lot of companies, um, Western companies in, in Hong Kong. Um, the one people, the one group they don't think about are the people who work for them. Mm. The people who are running HSBC all have foreign passports. Yeah. You think any of you think many of their till clerks have, have have foreign passports? And every one of I think I'm right in saying that every one of my successors, as as it were, chief executive in Hong Kong, has either themselves or their mem or members of their family had foreign passports. Yeah. The, the present guy, the the police cop, the police guy, um, his wife. And two children have British passports. The last one, Carrie Lam, her husband and two sons have foreign passports. Now I'm not, I'm not against them. You know, good for them. It doesn't show terrific confidence in the future of, of Hong Kong <laughs> under communism. But, ne but nevertheless, yeah. uh, you know, good for them. They can, they can, they can see a good thing when it comes along. But it's, it's, it's one of the great paradoxes of history. Although the government is being good now by, about increasing BNO passports in order that. that uh, Younger people get them as as well, but one of the paradoxes is that is that is that people who have British passports or, or whose own kids have British passports have been persecuting kids who don't, and I think that's something that yeah. should uh, bother us all.